No, please, keep the music going. That was nice. That muted trumpet just sets the tone for the morning. I'm so glad to be here with you. Can you hear this okay? Too loud? I, uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you. I'm, you have to excuse me, though, if my clothes don't seem to fit or, or quite match. I had to buy them at the gift shop at the hotel because I came with nothing uh, due to a stupid misunderstanding. When I was first invited to speak here, I, I could have sworn that she said it was called the Nude Tech <laughs> Network. So I came with nothing on. I got a lot of strange looks at the airport, uh, although I got through security pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> obviously not hiding anything. Um, they were sort of growling at me at this airport until I realized that was just the name of the airport. Grr. They, uh... But then I got to, uh, got to the Amway Grand and uh, I saw many of you in the lobby and you all were wearing clothes and I felt like an idiot. You know, I had to quickly buy some. This has happened to me before too where I've misunderstood. I, I have no excuse. A few years ago, I was invited to keynote National Conference of the National Writing Project, and I came in on horseback to the... Uh... Sure, it sounds obvious now, writing with a T, but I, I didn't get that. I clearly have to... It was really messy for the people in the aisles, to not, not to mention embarrassing. Got to get better cell reception, I think. In fact, now that I think of it, there was this one other time, too, when I misunderstood. I, an organization asked me to do some work for them called uh, Stand for Children. I got the preposition wrong. I thought it was Stand on Children, and I'm still settling some of those lawsuits. Anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. I'm dressed. I'm ready to go. You're dressed. I see now. Um, and I have the uncomfortable feeling that every single thing I say, memorable or not, every cough and burp is going to be tweeted in real time. <laughs> Fortunately, only to your followers who are also in this room, so at least we're safe. Right now. <laughs> so anyway, I am not going to talk to you about technology. I'm going to talk to you about the other aspect of New Tech Networks, plan, which has to do with the idea of project-based learning, and not only to celebrate with you that concept and revive and invite you to reflect on its meaning, but also to goose you a little, because I don't like to give the kind of talk where people just sort of go, mm, and nod, and feel temporarily validated, and the next day there's nothing left. Um, I want to invite you to think about how much further we might go in challenging the status quo and our traditional assumptions and practices that infiltrate even schools that are set on a lovely new path of projects and the useful use of technology, which is not the same as technology per se. A lot of technology used in schools, I don't have to tell you, is not particularly productive if we have ambitious goals and, in fact, serves only to cement into place many of the traditional assumptions. Stuff like PowerPoint and interactive whiteboards mostly serve to keep the teacher in charge of transmitting facts to empty receptacles, but to do it with a new toy. Uh-oh. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the use of technology as the use of projects or any other single criterion as a way, I hope, not merely to put a new polish on the way schools have been, not merely to have something fun to play with or something to sugarcoat, sugarcoat the way we've been doing things, but to rethink pedagogy 
to ask the tough, the radical questions about education. If we're not asking the radical questions, then we're not doing right by our kids. And I use radical in the, Lydia will appreciate this, original Latin sense of the term, because radical comes from the Latin meaning root. So we don't ask the question, what should be on our rubrics for evaluating kids? We would be asking why we would use rubrics at all, given that they smuggle standardization in through the back door and don't allow us to work with kids to qualitatively think about what has happened instead of reducing them to numbers but now in a slightly new way, perhaps even a more complicated way that draws their attention away from the learning and toward how well they're doing and what rating or ranking they deserve. But now we have new technology and we have new more elaborate systems for doing exactly what we've been doing for more than a hundred years. And we pride ourselves on 21st century schools that aren't really all that different in their underpinnings from 20th or even 19th century schools. That's the challenge, is to ask ourselves and respectfully ask our colleagues the radical questions. What characterizes traditional schools more than anything else is fragmentation, dividing stuff into little bitty pieces. That's the legacy of scientific management from 1911 and Frederick W. Taylor's book on the assembly line. That's the legacy of Boris Frederick Skinner. You may not have known his first two names, but you know who I'm talking about, right? man who did his research with rodents and pigeons and wrote his books about people, that B.F. Skinner. The Skinnerian legacy is present every time we talk about alignment to someone else's curriculum which is broken down into little bitty pieces with lots of rating and ranking and positive reinforcement, giving kids the equivalent of a doggy biscuit for pressing the bar or finding their way through the maze. It's a different view of human nature, of children, and of learning than the best research and practice and theory has allowed us. But we break stuff down into pieces. We take the idea of learning in its real organic sense, and we artificially say, the bell has rung, you have to put down the binomial equations and go read Faulkner down the hall. Or even in elementary school, put away your social studies books, boys and girls, and take out your reading books. Or more absurdly, put away your reading and take out your spelling workbooks. Making sure to teach spelling as its own little bitty fiefdom that isn't connected to literacy more generally. None of this is a fact of nature, the idea of separating natural science from social science, or mathematics from literacy for that matter. There are problems out there to be solved that require us to draw from a wealth of different skills and knowledge bases. But we divide it into pieces. We divide the facts and the skills within each discipline into a bunch of individual components and teach them separately. Linda Darling Hammond at Stanford once remarked that, quote, if we taught babies to talk, as most skills are taught in school, they would memorize lists of sounds in a predetermined order and practice them alone in a closet. <laughs> we divide learning about stuff from doing the stuff, if the kids are lucky enough to get to do at all. We divide kid from kid, beginning in elementary school teaching, as one researcher put it many years ago, the central lesson of the American elementary school, which is how to be alone in a crowd. I want to see what you can do, not what your neighbor can do, as my elementary school teachers used to say to me. What they really meant was, 
I want to see what you can do artificially deprived of the skills and help of the people around you, rather than seeing how much more you can accomplish in a well-functioning team that's more authentic and like real life. I don't think they put it that way. It's all about dividing up, and then in high school, dividing up clumps of kids based on what we think or predict or cause their trajectory to be after they graduate with certain kids getting the more advanced courses, not necessarily better courses, but certainly harder courses while others get remedial this and basic that enough to turn anyone off to learning. Divide. It's all about fragmentation. If we ever talk about whole children, about the idea of there being more than academics, we talk about their social needs, their physical development, artistic, and so on, we even divide those up with specific programs to address their social needs, to address their uh, artistic development, uh, emotional intelligence, and so on, one after another. That's not the whole child. The whole child is an integrated whole, which means that every aspect of education has to address different features of the person. But the fragmentation temptation makes its presence felt even for those enlightened folks who talk about the whole child. It's all about fragmentation. Step one toward remedying this ugly residue of traditionalism is if we're going to have a pretty traditional school divided into traditional subjects, at least kids are studying those topics in a context and for a purpose. And no, it will not do as a purpose to say that they're going to expect you to know this next year. Or you've got to learn trigonometry because you need it to get into college. Or you need to have this group of facts digested temporarily until you spit it out again in third grade because the fourth grade teachers expect it of you. We do stuff, especially to younger kids, that is totally without intrinsic merit, without intellectual justification. And we do it purely because of a phenomenon I've come to call bigouti, which stands for better get used to it. This stuff makes no sense, but people are going to do it to you later, so we have to prepare you for that by subjecting you to pointless experiences now while you're young. This is actually the driving justification for the use of standardized tests, competition, homework, grades, and other things for which there is probably not a good justification at any age, but certainly not for younger children. It reminds me of the Monty Python sketch, Getting Hit on the Head Lessons, where a guy walks into a room, whack, ow, no, not ow, turn your head like this and say, wah, try it again, wah. Ah, better. Why are you hitting me? This is getting hit on the head cut lessons. Standardized testing, competition, homework, grades, and the like are excellent preparation for getting hit on the head again later. And there are actually people who, without any trace of irony, justify doing things to younger students purely because they're going to be done to them later. How many people in their jobs or in their lives will ever need anything beyond what they would learn in the first month of Algebra 1. Well, we have some, I don't know about their lives, but we have some research about their jobs, and it turns out that a tiny fraction, far fewer than one out of five, will ever in their jobs require anything, I think, beyond anything in Algebra 1, or even including that. And yet, the research shows that you need advanced math because it's excellent preparation for more advanced math that you might get in college. <laughs> we have terrific middle school teachers who understand the developmental needs of their young and pre-adolescents and are being compelled to teach badly, which is to say like traditional high school teachers purely because the high schools expect the kids to come into high school with this bunch of facts crammed into short-term memory. We have kindergartens that have been turned into bad first grades, all because of this notion not merely of fragmentation, but of preparation 
if we teach them in a context and for a purpose, we then have literacy being learned because, not because vocabulary or grammar or spelling are ends in themselves, but purely as means to an end of being able to communicate stuff that matters and to do it effectively, to read with understanding. I have a friend who likes to say, I don't care whether kids can spell well. Some of the brightest people I know are lousy spellers. I care whether they know how to edit the stuff they're writing so the final draft doesn't make them look like an idiot. And they would draw from the repository of information about correct spelling they have in their head, but they would also draw from spell check, a dictionary, and the person sitting next to them like real people do. Whether they're good spellers, we get all this. Look, research about grammar has shown for years, decades even, that there is no value whatsoever to the explicit instruction about grammar. That even if you use grammar outcome variables, people do better if you spent that time doing real reading and writing. You may not know how to diagram a sentence. When was the last time you were asked outside of a classroom to do that? And the same is true for mathematics, where the best math classrooms are not merely taking a predetermined list of, now they have to check off the knows how to use a Venn diagram standard, and teach this garbage to kids, or the definition of an irrational number, which you can always look up, real mathematics is done in order to figure out what the hell your odds are playing that slot machine. <laughs> or whether it is ever possible, no matter how many recounts you do in a very close selection, to arrive at the truth, or whatever. in a context and for a purpose, for literacy and for mathematics. Two educators in New York who are married, Jackie and Marty Brooks, had a great line in a book about constructivist teaching. They said, I'm paraphrasing here, not because I think I can say it better, but because I don't remember. But they said something like, um, so often we get frustrated as teachers because kids don't remember what they learned. But that's not true. Probably they never learned it. They were just taught it. They may have remembered the facts temporarily, but in terms of meaningful learning, it never happened unless it was taught in a context and for a purpose. Now, I have a lot more to say, and maybe you do too, about what that means in the context of a traditionally fragmented and preparation-oriented classroom. But I'm interested in step two, and I think that's why you're here as well. Step two is to question the classroom, to question the division between disciplines, to question the organization of the curriculum. The best schools are not organized around lists of facts and skills and separate disciplines. They're organized around problems and projects and questions. Notice, not just projects added on to the traditional curriculum, but these projects as the organizing principle of the entire curriculum, that's radical. And that's exciting. But it's not new, which is why I have little patience for 21st century this and that. Means very little. I wrote a satirical piece about this. Oh, that's not enough. We need 22nd century skills, and we need them now. You know, just <laughs> anybody who uses this sort of the whatever the 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 phrase, the marketing campaign of of the moment is deserves that kind of skepticism. Pick the thing that you think is most important in terms of the way kids should be learning and ask whether it wasn't also appropriate in the 20th century. We just weren't doing it, you know, or won't probably be appropriate in the next century. In 1918, John Dewey's associate, William Kilpatrick, was talking about project-based learning, talking about the need for, quote, wholehearted, purposeful activity proceeding in a social environment. He added, 
the essential factor is the presence of a dominating purpose. That's what defines project-based learning. Real purpose. The fact that they're going to want you to know this in the next stage, that's what Lillian Katz calls vertical relevance. You need to get this now because when you move up in the ladder, you're going to need it. But horizontal relevance means what you're doing in school now might be connected to a question you have this very afternoon about something maybe even that takes place outside of school. It implies authenticity, real life problems, not cute projects that you think up for the kids because they'll find it amusing or entertaining or even useful at accumulating skills with sugar to help the medicine go down, but problems and projects that they care about. Organizing it that way. Do you see the problem here? I'm just going to hint at this, something I'll say more about later, and I hope you all have been chewing on already. You see the problem with trying to benchmark the effectiveness of what you're doing in your schools by how closely you meet district and state standards? District and state standards are not using these meaningful criteria for learning. They're still talking about how many lists of facts, skills, and subskills on the behaviorist model the kids have had forced down their throats. If you measure new tech network success on the basis of meeting state standards, you will undermine the quality of new tech network because those standards aren't good enough for you. And not only do they not rise to the level of true project-based learning if you take them too seriously, those district and state standards, or worse, that multiple choice tests, one size fits all, that are linked to the standards, you will begin to reduce the quality of the teaching in order to meet bad criteria and to have kids do well at tests that measure what matters least. I know there's a gun to your head during these dark, dark reactionary days as future educational historians will view this time in history when we lost our collective minds, or at least lost our children's minds, with this talk about top-down, heavy-handed, test-driven, corporate-style, data-oriented approach. If you don't get nervous about lots of talk about data in the context of children, you need to recharge your crap detector. <laughs> That's not an argument against assessment. It's an argument against bad assessment, and it's an argument against billionaires and politicians who know less about learning than you do getting to dictate to you not only what you're teaching and how, but what the basis will be for evaluating your success. Believe me, the best teachers in this room spend most of their professional lives actively ignoring or subverting the state standards. The question is, will we organize to have a voice to educate the adults, the politicians working for us, the journalists reporting on education who report in monosyllables, test scores go up, that good, <laughs> so that they can come to understand that real project-based learning organized around problems and projects is far superior to the traditional model the very model that is underscored and driven by the use of hundreds of standards. Every fourth grader will be able to dot, dot, dot. We'll remember this fact. We'll know that. We'll be able to do this. That's the fragmentation we're trying to transcend. Don't confuse what I'm talking about here and what I hope you're doing with projects that are separate from the teaching of facts and skills, where we do the real instruction, and then you get to do a project to test it out. Let me say it again. Projects, problems, questions, 
as the organizing principle of everything that kids are doing in your school. And part of that implies overcoming the divisions between disciplines. True interdisciplinary instruction means you should be spending most of your time in teams, thinking mostly as a generalist, as an educator of kids, not an educator of mathematics or science or Spanish or chemistry. High school teachers in particular, and I used to be one, have this tendency more than elementary school teachers to pride themselves on the complexity of what they teach compared to elementary school teachers, as if because what I'm teaching is harder to master, that means that I know more about education, which isn't necessarily true. And thinking primarily that I have this repository of information to transmit to the students sitting, God help us, in rows. But in the great high schools, you manage to transcend your expertise in physics or romantic literature or calculus to, to work with your colleagues to create a school-wide network of project and problem-based learning. You're not just doing projects in your discipline because real life and thinking do not align themselves neatly in these specific disciplines that we take for granted now, but which basically had to be invented at some point. This project-based approach has been developed and tested all the way from preschool to graduate school with remarkable Success. I don't know if you know this, if you teach high school, I'm not sure if you're aware of the larger uh, pedigree, let's call it, of this approach. I mentioned a moment ago Lillian Katz, one of my mentors in the field of early childhood education. She and her colleague from Canada, Sylvia Chard, wrote a book years ago called Engaging Children's Minds, The Project Approach in which they rejected both of the dominant models for teaching little kids. The dominant models are either you get them ready for a bad kindergarten by making sure they know their numbers and their letters and their colors, academics before kids can pronounce the word academics, or you say, yuck, just let them play and they do macaroni collages all day. And the alternative, is, as Katz puts it, a curriculum for preschoolers that is not academic, but it is intellectual. I thought that distinction was telling for people of all ages. A lot of stuff done that's academic, I don't want to have much to do with. It may be rigorous, but it's not particularly worthwhile or engaging. By the way, this is my favorite story about that word. Principal, who I know, whoops, okay. Thanks. Well, entirely my fault for turning this into a track and field event. <laughs> Thank God I found the clothes in the gift shop before that happened. That's all I can say. <laughs> Too much information. Uh, principal I know was asked by a parent early in the year, one morning, as kids were being dropped off, are you going to give my child a rigorous education this year? And my friend, the principal, said, you know, I'm not sure. Let me look up the word tonight, and I'll get back to you with an answer tomorrow, which I found a very promising first response, frankly. And the next day, he found the parent and said, the answer to your question is, good heavens, no. Now, I used to say to people at this point in telling the story, Tonight, go find a good unabridged dictionary and look up the word. But of course, you could do that instantly right here, couldn't you, if you wanted to. And if you have, to keep me honest, you will probably find in any good dictionary, online or otherwise, that rigorous has, usually in the dictionary, it says see synonyms at harsh or rigid or something like that. But I defy you to find any definition of the word rigorous that could conceivably be associated with richer, more engaged, and excited learning that matters. I don't want my kids getting a rigorous education, 
because that's based on the fundamental confusion driving school reform, which is that if it's harder, it must be better. AP courses are among the hardest in almost any high school. Does that mean they're good? At least ask the question. In fact, AP courses typically are lecture-driven, textbook-based in most schools, and in any case, exist for the purpose of getting kids a particular score, a three, four, or five on an exam. So that if you taught an AP course in American history and you happen to find that the kids were really curious about the Civil War and whether it was mostly about slavery, as we were told, and why we didn't just let the South secede, and they wanted to read primary source documents instead of just a textbook, and they wanted to spend a month and a half using the Civil War as a case study for understanding what it means to think like an historian, which is what the best history courses are like. The AP teacher has to say, I'm sorry, we have to be at the Korean War by March. <laughs> and there the National Science Foundation has excoriated AP science courses as a great way to make sure nobody grows up to be, want to be a scientist. I'm not saying AP teachers aren't skilled. I'm saying that AP courses don't do justice to their teaching skills. And more generally, I'm saying just don't assume that if it's rigorous, that means it's of higher quality. And this is a problem you can make in a, pro a, pro a problem, uh, an error you could make in a, in a project-based environment as well. But when you're thinking about meaningful stuff, intellectually valuable stuff in preschool, for example, you're not talking about their academic skills. You're having the kids think in a systematic way about the stuff they're already wondering about, like a month-long project on the weather, or trucks and transportation, or something like that, in order to quote, I'm quoting Katz and Chard here, make fuller, deeper, more accurate sense of their experiences. That book, by the way, is very useful if you can do some substitution and extrapolation in your mind for teaching older kids. But now let's look at the other end of the, of the continuum. The idea of problem-based education was developed in the late 60s at McMaster University for teaching doctors, future doctors, to revolutionize a medical school curriculum. They don't take separate courses in cardiology and histology and nephrology and so on, and then when you graduate, you go into a pick a residency and good luck using that stuff or putting it all together. It's all fragmented. The problem-based approach starts from the beginning of medical school with real patients who have real illnesses in which the medical students have to learn how to acquire and integrate what we know from a great many different sub-disciplines into solving real problems. It makes sense all along the way. And so project-based education is more than just projects on top of a curriculum. That's what the curriculum is about, and it involves everyone teaching in the school together to do lengthy, multidisciplinary. The problem with in the word interdisciplinary is some people assume it means that the disciplines naturally are the pillars, the, the cornerstones, but we just connect them somehow. In the worst case, it's totally perfunctory. Like you do a, a math problem, but because you're studying something about China in social studies or history class, you, you have word problems that involve four Chinese students who are trying to figure out how to blah, 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 blah. You know. But what if instead you were trying to figure out how to, how would you design a car for contemporary Chinese people, given the constraints on the effect on the environment, given the current and expected earning potentials, given the traffic patterns in Shanghai and Beijing? What would that look like? If everybody came together, 
and you had to design a car, kids would have to, and then explain it, they would have to be drawing from and becoming more adept at language facilities, maybe even some translation here, learning some Mandarin, but certainly mathematics, science, social studies, history, all of this coming together in the service of a real problem that really matters. If you don't want to design a car for China, have them design a new playground for the local elementary school. What would you do, given the constraints and resources, to make school lunches better? These are projects that matter. They are necessarily interdisciplinary, and if you have the guts, they can be the driving force of the curriculum. But what is most exciting for kids, what is most productive about this approach, is precisely what is most unsettling for all of us. Because when you think about it, what I have just described directly or indirectly challenges very basic assumptions built into American ideology. It is not a coincidence that what I've been describing has existed only at the margins of our schools and only in a few schools. Because when you do this seriously, you don't just run up against the fact that some idiot in your state house is telling you that we're going to let your school continue to live only if your students have an improved score on a lousy test devised by people far away for the purpose of spreading out the scores so you can rank. The problem is that when you do this stuff, you challenge assumptions made about learning. For example, the notion that if it's rigorous, it must be better and that we need to raise the bar in American education. Have you heard this expression? Never mind that this expression, as far as I can tell, originated in the world of show horses, <laughs> which tells you pretty much everything you need to know about the attitude of children on the part of people who talk like this. More importantly, it's saying we're not going to question the basic assumptions and practices of education. We're going to do the same damn thing, but now we're going to do it harder, tougher, faster, louder, meaner. And that will cause us to have more rigorous education so that we can... What's the goal? What is the goal beyond the testing? What's the goal beyond... What's going on now? What does President Obama Bush, because educationally there's no real difference, except that Obama has intensified the incredibly counterproductive stuff that Bush began beyond what the right-wingers around Bush ever dreamed possible. But what does the president talk about? What's the purpose of schools? Why are we doing all of this? Why do we need to have higher test scores? Why do we need to have more rigor? Why do we need to have more standards that now are going to be one-size-fits-all on a national level? Why? What is every speech by every politician and every business group saying the whole point of education is? Is it about building a thriving democracy? Never. Never hear about that. Is it about helping each child to reach his or her potential as a human being and a learner? No! It's about corporate profits. It's about making sure that our corporations can triumph over their counterparts in other countries. That's why all you hear about from Obama in every single speech on education is the STEM subjects. Not because he believes that science and mathematics are intrinsically more valuable than the study of literature or history, but because you can measure it and connect it to dollars. And all of our schools are really thought of by every person who talks about school reform. Merit pay, undermining tenure protections, more tests to evaluate teachers and students, taking money from regular public schools and giving them to quasi-private charters. Every aspect of school reform makes perfect sense when you realize the purpose of school reform has to do with economics, not education, and not child development. It all clicks. And so if we're willing to question that and stand for the children in the way an organization by that name is clearly not doing, then what we have to do fall, becomes clearer in terms of the practical implications of this. But it challenges the ideology. 
project-based learning at its best is the opposite of back-to-basics garbage, where everything is done sequentially, everything is fragmented. What we need are controversial and complex, ill, what's the term Herbert Simon came up with? I, I found it so lovely, ill-structured problems. Well-structured problems are the kind you get in most standardized tests and in most classrooms. The kind where you know how to solve them, you're given an algorithm, and you just set about, and it's clear what's the right answer. Most problems in real life are not like that. Ill-structured problems. Not trying to get the right answer, because sometimes it's not clear what the right answer is. And sometimes, well, the right answer approach doesn't ask much of us. An educator I really like named Eleanor Duckworth at Harvard said, knowing the right answer requires no decisions, carries no risks, and makes no demands. It is automatic, it is thoughtless. She adds, when children's ideas, rather than being taken seriously, are, quote, simply scanned for correspondence to what the teacher wants, well, it isn't hard, too hard to figure out, quote, what happens to children's curiosity and resourcefulness later in their childhood. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there never are right answers. I'm not offering some sort of parody of West Coast relativism. Well, and if you think seven and three are 11, then that works for you and it's valid, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that even in mathematics, even in elementary school, let alone high school and university mathematics, most of the time is spent thinking about the concepts and becoming mathematical thinkers. Most math taught in high schools offers to students exercises that don't deserve to be called problems. They're not really problems and there's no mathematical thinking involved. It's a step-by-step, -step, here's the algorithm, here's the trick, here's how you reorganize the variables, here's how you solve the binomial equation, here's what you do when there are two variables, now you go and do this 50 more times. And some students are good at this, but end up not particularly enjoying it or understanding what math is really about. And other students aren't good at it or just hate it so much that they Leave, check out, tune out, burn out, drop out. And that's just math where there are right answers. Let alone in other disciplines where we just pretend there are. And you're supposed to organize history and it's mostly about, I wish when I was teaching high school English, which I did for a while, that I had asked a lot fewer questions that have a right answer. I actually had the kids memorize the definition between a simile and a metaphor. You know what the correct answer to that is? Who cares? That's an arbitrary definition. Now, metaphors per se, I find extraordinary and compelling. I'll go on, I'll rhapsodize till you think my mental health is at issue here about metaphors. I find metaphors a rebellion against the given life as we're presented with it where we, we ourselves take the shovels and dig underneath the layer of the literature or the actual, but that's, there's no right answer to what's the metaphor in this text. The more focused you are on right answers, which you are almost required to be by the standards and testing juggernaut that has our schools in its grip, the lower the quality of the learning. That's what we're challenging here. If you're not making people nervous in your community, you're not doing project-based learning right. But you have to educate them so they turn their nervousness into excitement. So they begin to say, my God, why didn't I get this kind of education? And if they want to know what your standardized test scores are, that just tells you how much more work you have to do because standardized tests are so-so measures of traditional education and useless as measures for the stuff that matters. 
In fact, we have research, I don't know if you know this, there's research showing that even in non-project-based schools, in, in, even in traditional schools, there is actually a statistically significant negative correlation between student scores on a variety of standardized tests and the depth of their thinking. It's not a perfect negative 1.0. Of course, there are some kids who are deep thinkers and they also do really good on the test. And there's some, uh, except in grammar, where they would know to say really well on the test. And there are some kids who are superficial thinkers and they don't do well at all on the test. But in general, according to the research, if all you know about this kid is he gets a high score on a standardized test, and you're a gambling person, you would gamble on a shallow approach to ideas. Because the high scoring kids are typically the ones who will guess well, who know the, the art of psyching out the test designers. They're good test takers. That doesn't mean they're good thinkers. They're often bad thinkers, or at least lazy thinkers, because they've been led to try to figure out what the right answer is. A lot of students, I mean, do you not know if you're a teacher? Do you not know a lot of kids who you know are really impressive thinkers? They are truly creative and innovative. You admire how their minds work, but they just don't do well on tests. Raise your hand if you know a bunch of kids like that. Let me ask you the reverse. Do you know kids where you're not so sure about how much is really upstairs, but boy, are they good at taking these tests and they get good scores? Raise your hand if you know those kids. You put those two groups together, you may have a majority. Standardized tests simultaneously overestimate and underestimate. So why would you ever measure your success as a school based on tests? They're not just pointless. They're not just a measure of socioeconomic status, though boy, that is primarily what they are. Standardized tests are excellent measures of the size of the houses near your school. I'm saying the, wor the, the news is worse. High test scores may be a bad sign. High standardized test scores are nothing to be proud of. And low test scores are nothing to be ashamed of which is why we have to make sure that that never becomes our externally advertised or our internally driving criterion for how well we're doing. But again, that challenges the status quo. There's two other pieces of ideology that you're going to be challenging if you take what I'm talking about seriously. I want to linger on the last one and then use that to goose you on two other issues that are related. The second piece of ideology that is challenged if you're doing this right is the fact, gets back to my elementary school teacher, I want to see what you can do, not what your neighbor can do. Without even thinking about it, because it comes so naturally to us in this culture, we tend to oscillate between an extreme individualism about making sure that we give assignments and assessments to each kid all by him or herself. And we strand kids on separate desks, strictly limiting the interaction they can have with the people sitting around them. Or, worse, our ideology is about defeating other people. It's not even just about an individualistic model. It's about victory. Your goal is to triumph over the kids around you. From the earliest days in elementary school, the race to be called on first, ooh, 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 before the kids are too cool to raise their hand all the way. to the stickers and stars, 
until we get to high schools where they actually not only grade students, but grade on a curve so that the number of top grades are artificially limited. No matter how well you all do, you can't all get the top grade, which is, I don't know another word for it, immoral. Or to rank the students' grades. So the goal is not merely to get better grades, put aside learning, the goal is to step on the faces of my friends and peers, destroying any possible sense of a caring community, which is so critical for real learning to take place. A lot of kids don't know really what it means to interact in well-functioning groups because they've been told that if they share what they know with the kids around them, that's something we call cheating. The words give us away. If we do talk about cooperation in American education, we use the word in this perverted way, where it really means obedience, as in, I want you all to cooperate now, which means do exactly what you're told. It's the equivalent of the team player in the workplace, which has nothing to do with well-functioning teams and everything to do with mindless conformity. But it's in the service of beating people. Now we go back to the presidents and the Bill Gates and other people who know less than my cab driver yesterday about what learning is about, but my cab driver doesn't have billions of dollars to impose his ignorance on the rest of us with a mandate of law. I need to take a breath after that sentence. The people who know something about how learning really happens understand that it's about what we can learn from one another. But when I made reference before toward economic goals driving the purpose of education, it's not just about dollars and cents, it's about beating other countries. It's about, and if you ever see this phrase, it's time to worry about whatever these people are going to say next. Global competitiveness in the 21st century. It's not just about economics. They're not just saying the hell with democracy and children. We just see children as future employees, which is what they're saying implicitly. They're saying it's about making sure that people who don't live in this country are always inferior to us. Think about those standardized tests that are given internationally, like PISA and TIMS where we get these periodic reports about, oh no, our schools suck, to use the technical psychometric term, <laughs> because our test scores are, we're number seven for fourth grade reading, we're number 13 and whatever. Think about this for, for there are many, many problems with these rankings. Number one, they're only as good as the standardized tests and how they are designed that lead to the rankings. So you would never cite a number like that until you were sure that those tests measure what's important. Number two, the idea of talking about Amer the quality of American schools makes about as much sense as talking about the quality of American air. I mean, it's the differences from place to place that drive the outcome. If you look at the rich suburbs in this country, on an international scale, they do very well, thanks very much. But it just so happens that we have a hell of a lot more poor children in this country than they have in almost any other industrialized country in the world. And as a result of that, our overall test scores don't look good. That doesn't mean we need merit pay and more rigor. It means we need to solve the poverty problem, which teachers can't do. If you look, If you look at these rankings, though, the main thing you're struck with is the whole idea of a ranking. Even if American schools didn't do as well as whatever the enemy du jour is, I don't know, Singapore or, or whatever, there always has to be an enemy out there you know, for, for various reasons in this country. And even if the tests were good measures, what are you saying implicitly when you say that we're unhappy with our current ranking and we need to be number one. It's as if learning was an athletic event. We're number one! It's basically the goal of all the people who point to those rankings. This says, 
And I don't see any other conclusion that can be inferred, if that's your goal, global competitiveness even for children, is that we want children who live in other countries not to learn well. I find that view both intellectually and morally bankrupt, and it is at the heart of talk about global competitiveness. We are challenging that addiction to winning to making sure that other people have to fail in order that we can succeed, that is present in every valedictorian honor bestowed, in every awards assembly, which is a way of making sure that some kids are set up in front of their peers as better than the peers watching. The more focused you are on winning, the less focused you are on excellence, let alone on community. But real project-based learning turns this inside out because it's about us answering our questions together. I hope most of the projects you're doing are done with groups of kids, not with individuals. Otherwise, we're not challenging that bit. We're perpetuating that bit of American ideology, which leads me to the third bit of ideology. And that is the idea of control, that some people get to decide what other people do. And the people in the underneath position are deprived of any sense of autonomy. At its best, project, problem, question-oriented learning combines choice with community to create something that most people in this culture are completely unfamiliar with, democracy. Which is not about voting. Voting is adversarial majoritarianism. I'm talking about the real kind of democracy where the group has to figure out how we're going to design our project together and what we do when we can't agree. What it means to have to really listen to other people's preferences and the reasons for their preferences, what it means to forge a compromise, what it means to hash out a consensus, what it means to do what psychologists call perspective taking, which is where you imagine how the world looks from someone else's point of view. That's what happens in democratic classrooms. Having the kids vote on which thing to do is very fast, but it leaves a lot of the kids feeling even more unhappy. They expressed their preferences and were completely overwritten and now are expressly being made to do what they told you they don't want to do. And all the kids, winners and losers alike, never had a chance to do real democracy with all of the social and moral growth that that entails. Real democracy. Did you come to this conference hoping to find some good project ideas? Or did you come here hoping to find the resources to go back and figure out how to help the kids find and create and construct their projects? That's a big difference. Because even the cleverest curriculum, even the best project, that adults came up with unilaterally and imposed on the students is only going to be incrementally better than the traditional status quo. What the best project-based learner teachers are doing is empowering the kids so that most of the projects have been designed by the kids to respond to interests and questions of the kids. That's the difference between a first step, for which I congratulate you, and really moving towards something that is a radical challenge to the awful status quo. You want it in a bumper sticker? Kids learn to make good decisions by making decisions, not by following directions. And that's true even about the projects they work on. Do you know, I hope there are breakout sessions on this, because if I were asked to think of what breakout sessions would you have in a conference like this, 
One of the first ones I would think of is, how do you hold, yeah, yeah right, I should have spoken up earlier. <laughs> What does it mean to facilitate a class meeting, a democratic class meeting? How, you can't do what I'm talking about unless you know what it means to be other than just the traditional teacher who controls the classroom. Do you have times when you have all the kids get together, possibly in a circle so everybody can see everybody else's eyes, and talk about how school is going, and talk about what we're going to learn next? and bring kids in on sharing news, solving problems, making decisions, even schools where they're still doing the god-awful 47-minute period. The best teachers find time to, they take some of that time. I watched a high school geometry teacher at an awful high school, which is to say a very typical high school. <laughs> the school is too big. The classes are too big. The school is tracked up the wazoo with only some kids, mostly white and affluent, getting the AP and honors, and the kids of color and low income getting the basic stuff, which is just it's dreadful stuff. Um, and he's only got 50 minutes each day, and then the bell rings, and you salivate and run over to history or whatever. And he has to give out grades, there's an expectation of homework, it's all the stuff we have to move beyond. And, and this guy said, I watched him teach for a while, and he said, I only have 50 minutes with him, but we're going to spend the first 20 or whatever it takes in a class meeting to think together about how this is going. I have to give you homework? Well, let's talk about whether we should go over the homework in our small groups or as a whole class, and why. So there's a kind of intellectual dimension to the decision making. And how, let's talk about how your individual and team projects are going. He's having the kids learn about geometry by making videos, by doing architecture, and getting ideas from one another. So he says, I, I, may, I only have 50 minutes to do this stuff, but I'm going to I'm going to be a lot more productive with 30 minutes if the kids feel they want to be here, feel they're part of a community, and have something to say about what goes on the walls, how the chairs are set up, what we're going to do next, how the, how the assessment will work. This teacher, I'm sorry to say, still gave traditional tests. We're all on a journey. But when I was there that day visiting this particular teacher, he said to them, a, a kid told me during, in between the classes while they were changing, Mr. Grove said to us, um, we we're going to have a test a few weeks ago on Friday, and, and we said, we're not ready. And I listened carefully for what was to come, he said. Well, I, he said, so when do you think you will be ready? And we decided to have the test the next Wednesday. Baby steps, folks, but most of us haven't taken those. I didn't when I was teaching, I have to confess. It's a tiny thing. You're still giving tests which are lousy at assessing ideas that matter. Tests, even teacher-designed tests, are best way, the good ways of measuring how, much, for, how many forgettable facts you've squished into short-term memory. You don't use tests if you're trying to assess thinking. That's not what tests are good for. Uh, certainly not multiple choice tests, fill in the blank tests. He was still giving tests, but at least he let the kids make one tiny decision, which is when we're going to take the test. And I said to these kids, oh my God, if I went back to a bunch of teachers and said that, teachers said, when do you want to take your test? The teachers would laugh and say, oh yeah, like I'm going to ask my kids that. They would say, never. And the kids said, we would not do that to Mr. Grove. He respects us too much. And I thought, that's it. The kids who take advantage and don't respect the teacher are kids who don't feel respected by the teacher, even nice teachers, because they had nothing to say about how the furniture is arranged or where we're going to discuss the homework if we, or if we have to have homework and why, what we're going to learn next with whom, all of that stuff in a democratic classroom that gets kids juiced. The kids will take advantage, but not in a classroom where the kids have something to say about what's going on. One teacher said to me, a teacher from Ohio, my job is to be as democratic as I can stand, which I thought was interesting. 
acknowledging that it's tough for the teachers sometimes, tough for the teachers, to get used to giving up power. I ask you to stop for a moment and think about this. People have all kinds of rationalizations for why we don't let kids help to design the curriculum and the assessment and the rules by which we live together in the classroom. Kids aren't mature enough, they're not responsible enough, we don't have enough time, blah, 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 blah. By the way, that's analogous to the rationalizations used by politicians to deprive teachers of autonomy in making decisions. If you're at the receiving end of that kind of micromanagement and disrespect, the least you can do is turn around and treat your kids the way you want to be treated, not the way you are being treated. But the reality is that if you're used to being the king or queen of your classroom, we learn from history that monarchs don't always abdicate gracefully. We have to be willing to introspect, to ask, do I make all the decisions here because I have to? Do I make most of the decisions here about what the projects are or whether there will be grades or homework or whatever? because it's in the best interest of kids learning? Or is it because I'm more comfortable? Or because I haven't been helped to shift to democracy? Or just because that's the way things have always been done? Do me a favor. We've got a limited amount of time left. But I want to ask you to do one thing right now that I hope you'll follow up on later. Think about one aspect of your teaching where if somebody pushed you, you would have to admit you've been making the decisions without even thinking about that fact. You just assume that's the way it has to be. One thing where you could give up some control to the kids. One decision. It could be a giant one. It could be a teeny one. In your teaching any aspect of your teaching, where if you were so motivated and courageous, you could go back next year and say, we're going to decide this together. Do me a favor. Take just a minute thinking to yourself about what that might be. If you want to make a note for later reference, it's up to you. Will you turn to one person sitting next to you, just one, not your whole table, and take a minute and a half to exchange ideas? Go.
Okay, my aunt fight you back. Let me describe, and I hope the idea you came up with, if you did, and the idea you heard, begin to percolate and invite you to think about other ideas. I want to give you a real life example of a kind of project based learning that you may have heard about, and I apologize if you're familiar with it already, but I think it's an amazing model to think about. Originally developed for middle school students, but could be used in high school. By uh, Jim Bean and Barbara Brodhagen in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, which they call curriculum integration, which is a name that is not exactly memorable or sexy, but let me describe to you how it works in the hope that you in your school would consider at some point something like this, or at least the principles that guide it could be applied to something you do. At the beginning of the year, each student is asked the following question. What questions do you have about yourself? And the kids might take a few minutes right then. They might take it home to think about. They come up with a list of questions individually. And then they get together, next step, with a few group mates. And they exchange questions and look for common themes. Oh, I asked, my, one of my questions was, when am I going to die? And your question was, how long are you going to live? That's kind of the same question, isn't it? Here. I asked, when am I, am I going to ever get married, and so on. And they look for the common themes. Next step. Each student is asked individually to think about the question, what questions do I have about the world? And they come together in their groups again. And once again, they look for common themes and try to name what those themes are. What do they have in common? Kids come up with amazing questions about the world, basic stuff that we've stopped thinking about sometimes because they seem unanswerable. I have a list of questions that they came up with in one such group, which is just fascinating. Um, everything from how do fax machines work to why are there religions. I mean, just amazing range. How did war start? Which is interestingly juxtaposed to uh, why are there religions. But anyway, they, so they come up with these things, and they look for common themes. And then the next step is to integrate the themes from their questions about themselves and their questions about the world. They're getting now to a higher level of abstraction. And the last step is for the teacher to take a whole wall, which is a whiteboard, a blackboard, or simply a wall covered with butcher block paper, and elicit the themes and questions from each group, and plaster it, and look together for things that overlap. They do this inductive, deductive process. Isn't this really just another way of saying that? Isn't this a subset or example of the other? And to come up with one overriding summative theme, which in some schools has been conflict and war. In another year, it might be the future. And the subsidiary questions that flow from that theme. And that, here's the punchline, becomes the curriculum for the year. Not for three weeks, for the year. And all of the stuff that the kids are required to have learned, because we have to sometimes, until we can take over the schools and have educators running things in education, we still have, for the time being, as we rebel against it, these standards to have to deal with and you figure out where they overlap and which proficiencies kids can develop in the traditional disciplines, if you must, in mathematics and science and foreign languages and literature and writing and reading and history and social studies and so on, and fine arts, and the proficiencies we will and can acquire in the process of exploring these themes that we came up with. The kids in these schools are unrecognizable for teachers who are burnt out and assume the worst about kids' lack of motivation, which typically says more about what they're being made to do and how little say they have about what they're doing, rather than telling us some deficit in the kid's head. These kids are excited about what they're doing partly because it's organized around questions and problems and projects, 
but partly because the questions are their questions, not just the teacher's questions. Extraordinary to watch. By the way, I was talking to, to Bean and Brodhagen about this model, and at one point we had a conversation about how do you assess? How do you have a sense of how well it's going, what the kids are doing, and by the way, how we're doing as educators, because that's mostly what we are assessing when we assess kids, whether we admit it or not. And I was, try I was scratching my head over that. How can you use, you can't use traditional, you wouldn't want to use a test, which in fact the best teachers have stopped using already, because they don't need that information and because it's not terribly useful. But the answer was sitting right in front of me, and even though this is the kind of stuff I traffic in for a living, I, I, didn't, I have to admit, I didn't come up with it. The answer to how you assess is, ask the kids. Bring the kids in on it is the watchword in democratic project-oriented schools. And figure out together, given that I have to get a sense now as a teacher of how it's going and where we could all improve, what are some ways by which you can show me what you have? And sometimes the answer is, you don't need to give us a test or a separate assignment. The projects that we're doing to learn, if you're watching and listening, are providing you with all the assessment data that you really need, even though it's not numerical data. So we're learning, and you're learning about our learning at the same time. Why would you have to give us any kind of summative traditional assessment like a test? Because when you watch our team struggling to figure out how we're going to solve this problem, you have all the information you need about who needs more help. That's an example. So I was going to talk to you about two other things to challenge you further, because I don't think I've been radical and uh, provocative enough at this point. Running out of time, I will deal with them both very quickly and invite you, if you want, to look up stuff where I've talked and others have talked about these issues more. I have uh, more than 120 articles freely available on my website, and my website is just my name, alfiecone.org. If you put alfiecone.com, you get there anyway. It's magic. Anybody who uses the word magic is a poor choice to keynote a new tech network conference. And yet, there, I've said it. Um, one thing I wanted to challenge you about is something I mentioned only very briefly. I'm going to try to do this quickly so that I can get a few questions from you since there's no breakout session following, and then still give you time enough to get to your first breakout session. But the first thing I wanted to challenge you about is why we make kids work a second shift when they get home from school. The research supporting the value, let alone necessity, of homework is non-existent for kids before high school and dubious even in high school. For example, there is at the high school level a correlation between getting and doing a lot of homework and how high your grades or test scores might be. But one, that assumes you think grades and test scores are useful indicators of the quality of learning. Two, it's just a correlation. They teach you this in the first day of statistics. The fact that two things go together doesn't mean the first one caused the second. Kids who go off on skiing vacations are disproportionately likely to go to expensive private colleges. Does that mean that skiing causes acceptance in the Ivy League? Third, the correlation is weak and tends to disappear when you use more variables simultaneously entering them into the equation. I have seen teachers and whole schools where they give virtually no homework and the kids do fabulously well. I have seen no evidence that kids who almost never do homework are at any intellectual disadvantage. 
And the more we think about the need to do homework, the more it reveals misguided assumptions on our parts about what learning is. The difference between reinforcing what happens at school, whenever you hear somebody use that verb, get nervous. Reinforcing, interesting. Where does that verb come from? It comes from our friend Boris Frederick Skinner in the context of work on lab animals. You can't reinforce understanding. All you can reinforce is a behavior. That's why the teachers who give lots of homework and are proud of doing that and say it reinforces what I'm doing during the day, I'm worried about what's happening to the kids in that class during the day let alone the homework, because of a crypto-behaviorist model that's focused on when you see this stimulus, you come up with this right answer. Understanding is a very different thing. The deeper the understanding of learning I have found, although I have no data to support this on the part of teachers, the less homework they tend to give. If they give homework, it's only on those occasions when they can make a case that it will help kids think more deeply about questions that matter and make kids more excited about what they're doing. Those are the two criteria I would propose to you. I'm not saying no homework ever. I'm saying certainly not regular homework where you decide in advance you're going to give it out almost every night. That's bizarre. That assumes that even before you know what you're assigning them, the very act of having to do more stuff at home is beneficial. Of course, there's no evidence for that. Give it out. Opt in to homework. The default should be six hours a day is enough academics. We want kids, when they get home, to learn artistically and physically and socially and emotionally and just have a chance to chill out the way we like to do after a hard day of work only on those rare occasions when you can prove that it's going to help the depth of their thinking and their engagement in learning. Should you presume to infringe on kids' evening time or family time, is what I would suggest. I have a lot more to say about this in a book uh, called The Homework Myth, which makes a fabulous gift. I, I, I have to add. <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to challenge you or invite you to think about is the prospect of grading. By the way, on my website, I have, if you look for it, and if you can't find it, write to me and I'll guide you to it, testimonials from real high school teachers who have stopped giving homework and explain why they've done it, how they did it, and what the results have been, as well as the question of grades. Folks, the research on grades finds three things to be true. If we took all of you, and you were all students, and I gave you all an assignment, and half of you I said simply do this, and the other half of you I said, do this, it's going to count for a grade, we would tend to find on average three results. Number one, the kids who were doing it for a grade became less interested in what they were doing and less likely to return to that topic or question on their own time. Two, the kids who are doing it for a grade, if given a choice, will pick the easiest possible task. Not because they're lazy or unmotivated, but because they're rational. <laughs> Duh, they would say. If the goal in here is to come up with a better report card, do better on a test, have a better grade, well, of course I'm going to pick the shortest book or the easiest possible project. This is not a problem of motivation. This is a problem of my realizing that when you say, I know you can get a better grade in here, you're saying, avoid all intellectual risk taking. Because trying to take intellectual risks and reach beyond what I'm comfortably capable of doing pulls in this direction, and getting an A pulls in that direction. That's why the best schools give no grades, because they want kids to challenge themselves, and that's exactly what happens. Assuming they're doing good curriculum, not worksheets. Assuming there's something worth learning. Even if there is something worth learning, folks, if you give them terrific projects and even let them help design the projects, but they're thinking, what grade am I going to get on it? Or what number on a rubric, which amounts to the same thing, which is why good teachers are moving away from rubrics too. 
If they're thinking about the grade, you are taking away with one hand what you have just given with another. You have given them amazing projects, you've given them choice, and now you're telling them it's all about how we're going to rate you or rank you. So the learning in their minds is just a means to an end. What do I have to do? Do we have to do this in the project? How long does the write-up have to be? Don't blame kids for asking these grade-oriented questions. Blame anyone who tells them they're going to get a grade. The third effect, according to research, is that when kids are trying to get a better grade, they not only lose interest in the learning and pick the easiest possible task, they tend to think in a more shallow way. Their question is, more, is less likely to be, how do we know that's true? Or, yeah, but how does it connect with that thing you were saying to us a few weeks ago? And they're more likely to ask, do we have to know this? Is this worth a five on the rubric? That's when you've lost them. It's bad enough to use rubrics to orient your own teaching away from the qualitative toward the quantitative, but if you give rubrics to the kids, it's over! Now it's not about learning. Read a book called Rethinking Rubrics in Writing Assessment by Maya Wilson. Or if you don't have time for a whole book, read my little article called The Trouble with Rubrics. That's a good example of how a little bitty shift, like from grades to umpteen numbers and subsets of stuff, we think of as a change, but we haven't left the status quo. We've intensified it because now kids are worrying even more about more things, about how good am I at this. And the more focused they are on how good am I, the less engaged they are with what they're learning. What do you do if you have to give a grade at the end? Because your administrator isn't here today. <laughs> Two things. I have an article coming out in Educational Leadership in November where I interview a bunch of high school teachers. I tried to take the hardest possible case about what they do because they know the research about the in inherently destructive effects of grades. Or grade substitutes, folks. Let's not get picky. If you still have things like meets expectations, exceeds expectations, exceeds expectations by a hell of a lot, still work. If you, that's still grades. You're still sorting them like potatoes into four or five categories, even if you don't call it A, B, C, D, F. Ask the radical questions. So what do you do? The teachers I talk to who are a little bit ahead of the curve and ahead of where I was when I taught high school do two things. One. Even if they have to give a grade at the end, they never, ever put a letter or number on any individual assignment or project. They may make you turn in a final grade in the office, but they're not making you push grades into kids' faces day by day, making it salient. Every grade a kid gets makes the kid a little less excited about learning. You write comments when you have the time, or better yet, have conversations with them if you can grab them, to deliver qualitative feedback. But never grade individual assignments, otherwise you're part of the problem and you can't just blame the administration. And the second thing that the gutsiest teachers are doing is they say, I'm being forced to give out a grade, but nobody told me I have to decide what the grade is by myself. Just like I'm doing projects, where did I get the idea that most of the project idea should come from me? And so these teachers meet with the kids, and some of them find time to do that if they have 150 kids. If you work in a smaller school, boy, are you lucky and have less excuse for not doing this. Meet with the kids and say, let's talk about how the class has gone for you. Oh, by the way, I have to put down some grade. What do you think it should be? And the first step is to negotiate it kid says, I think I want a B. Why? Blah, 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 blah. OK, it's a B. Now let's talk about the stuff that matters some more. How could my class get better next year? And if the kid says, I want an A, and you say, mm, A, really? Convince me. And you keep the final power to yourself. But at least the kid had the first, had a crack at it, and you listened. What the gutsiest, most radical teachers do, I don't expect you to get from traditional to here in 60 seconds. Can you guess? Can you see this coming? 
tell me what grade, and that, whatever you tell me, that's what you get. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to override you. When kids get that kind of power, first of all, they tend to pick exactly the same grade you would have picked for them. But in the odd case where they don't, and one kid out of 50 or 200 says, I want an A, and you're thinking you don't deserve that, get over it. Big deal. The good you have done by neutralizing the inherently destructive effects of grades. The good you've done by the trust and respect you've shown in all the kids. The good you've done by creating an environment that's about learning, not about assessment, especially bad assessment, far overrides the fact that some kid got a better grade than you think that kid deserves. People are really doing this right now all over North America. This is not something I thought up in the shower this morning before I ran down in my towel to buy the clothes. <laughs> These last two points I'm going to sum up with the following. If you are listening carefully to a thread throughout my remarks, not only about homework and grades, but about a lot of the stuff that preceded it, <clears throat> it's the following. This takes five seconds to say. It takes a lifetime to integrate and use if it matters to you. Before I say this sentence, no questions. I've gone on too long. I'm sorry. I'll be here if you want to come up and chat afterward. I know you have to get on, and I apologize. But I want to give you this last point. If you ask me, does project-based learning work? Should we have bilingual schools? When should we do cooperative learning? How should we teach kids to read who are having trouble with reading? Should we have charter schools and other changes on a macro level? I come back to you with every question you ask, including the question, how well is New Tech Network doing? And my response, my number one criterion is, what's the effect on kids' enthusiasm about learning? Their intrinsic motivation, their disposition to learn, their desire to read, play with numbers and ideas, if we took that seriously, where it's not just about achievement, let alone test scores, but it's really about the attitudes that kids take with them lifelong about learning itself, that drives the achievement and more. If you keep that with you as you think about project-based learning and the use of technology, make that your touchstone. What's the effect on the kids' excitement about figuring stuff out, then your practices will get better. If anything I said to you today was thought-provoking, I'm delighted to hear it. But I didn't come here all natural to be thought-provoking. I came here in the hopes, I hope this doesn't sound presumptuous, of being change-provoking. So when I go home and my high school daughter says, Daddy, how'd it go at, uh, in Michigan? How'd your talk go? I, I would have to say, I don't know. I'd have to visit these people's classrooms next year to see how the class goes. Now it's up to you. Thanks.